Good Friday morning, everyone, and welcome to the Backyard Naturalist. My name is Tim. I work at a really cool place called the Urban Ecology Center that also happens to host this series. Today, we are not looking at a specific critter that hangs out in our backyards, but a process that has shaped the land for millions of years, mostly at its own will, uh, until a group of species in the genus Homo learned to capture it and eventually to to control it, and we're talking about fire. I do realize that this title should have been burn before eating, um, but burn after eating was way easier to Photoshop. And I do wanna take the opportunity as always to give a huge thanks to our Backyard Naturalist community. Uh, your subscription purchases are the lifeblood of this program. And if you would like to know more about how to support the Backyard Naturalist with a subscription, please contact any member of the research team at the center. And whether or not you currently are, uh, are a subscriber and you are looking for a unique experience-based holiday gift, consider a gift subscription for friends and family. Additionally, I'd like to thank all the members of the Urban Ecology Center. Uh, becoming a member is by far the best way to support us. And uh, right now members and always members get fantastic discounts currently to places like Collective Flow, Wellness, and um, the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee. So for more details on member perks, please contact membership manager, Glenna Holstein. And here is some news we can all get excited about. Next Tuesday, November 23rd is Giving First Tuesday. And if you haven't heard of Giving First Tuesday, I encourage you to check into it and to help us spread the word. Giving First was piloted by the Urban Ecology Center last year during the pandemic and has now grown to become a collaboration of over 40 Milwaukee area nonprofits who are joining together to emphasize the importance of supporting our communities by giving uh, to local organizations first, before Black Friday, before Cyber Monday, uh, even before Giving Tuesday. So these 40 local nonprofits put the community first all year long, and we hope that the community will put them first in the giving season. If you'd like more information and direct links uh, to give to your preferred nonprofit, please visit givingfirstday.org. From the human phenology world, Thursday, November 4th was Diwali, a multi-day festival of lights celebrated by Hindus, Jains, Sikhs, and some Buddhists. And this symbolizes the spiritual victory of light over darkness, of good over evil, of knowledge over ignorance. And tomorrow, November 20th, is the Trans Transgender Day of Remembrance, a solemn observation memorializing those who have been murdered as a result of transphobia, and a day to draw attention to the continued violence endured by the transgender community. And finally, not sure, well, I'm not sure if any of you were up other than Aunt Mary uh, after midnight last night, and I have no idea. Well, I, I was going to say I had no idea if the, if the skies were clear, but uh, Mary said they were um, because I was asleep and um, the moon passed into the shadow of the earth for the second and final lunar eclipse of 2021, marking um, the longest partial lunar eclipse in 580 years. And if you missed it like I did, you can, as Mary said, watch it online, or you can wait until the evening of May 15th, 2022. That's right, 2022 is just around the corner, and I'm still trying to process last year, 2020, but uh, on May 15th, 2022, there will be a total lunar eclipse that occurs at a much more merciful time of night with the full eclipse beginning at 10.30 p.m. And once again, uh, the trailer before the feature length film uh, comes from our old pal, Chad, the nature dad, who is enjoying peak fall colors. And while it's past peak here in Southern Wisconsin, I am currently still graced with some beautiful golden leaves still hanging on for dear life outside my attic window here in Milwaukee. So we will hand it over to Chad. Hey friends, Chad, the nature dad here. And this is one of my favorite times of year. Let's see why. Oh yeah, it's that time of year where all these maple leaves here start to turn 
yellow as those temperatures at night get a little colder but more importantly as the nights get longer that really triggers the trees to shut down that production of chlorophyll and then all these other yellows and oranges and reds and sometimes purples can start to come out so that chlorophyll is uh, not being produced therefore the leaves are no longer looking green and then the carotenoids which produce your yellows and your oranges can be shown and the anthocyanins those are what are produce those red colors I'll show you a picture of those in just a sec oh yeah here's what I'm talking about these bright oranges and reds that pop out so these trees are typically maple trees they have a lot more sugar in their sap, so when the nights get cold, the chlorophyll is decreased. The sugars start to transform, turn into this beautiful red color. Absolutely amazing. All right, friends. Well, it's pretty much peak down here in southern Wisconsin, so get out there and enjoy these fall colors while they last. Join me next time. Who knows what we're going to find? Um, so... Hey, hey friends, Chad the Nature uh, Dad here. Here we go. Sorry about that. Um, I don't know how things were other places or, uh, you know, how this compares to other years. Um, but I feel like Washington Park this year seemed to be particularly colorful. Um, and so... I can do this. Here we go. Um, eventually, I'm going to figure out technology. So, um, but you'll see, see, you'll soon see that this program is going to be a little different from all the past episodes. And I'll ask you to get as comfortable as you can, and to the best of your ability, try to minimize distractions, external noises, but obviously keep your computer volume on. Uh, but Best yet, if you're able to dim the lights a little bit in your environment, I think you might enjoy the next half hour at a different level if you're able to get comfy and do some of these things. If you have a warm beverage, a comfy chair, a blanket. And before I start with this first video, I do want to credit the podcast Ologies with Allie Ward and Stuff You Should Know with Josh and Chuck as two important and often my go-to sources of information for this series, The Backyard Naturalist, um, and in, including this one. So um, when it makes sense, I like to begin these backyard journeys with the personal stories. The ones that you might tell other people while sitting around a fire in your backyard or at a campsite or on a beach. And some of my, uh, I, I wouldn't even call them my happiest memories. I would say that some of my most introspective memories uh, in my lifetime involve gazing at fire. And I've talked in the past about how cathartic playing catch with a baseball is, but sitting by a campfire, gazing and thinking, reflecting, whether I'm by myself or with a group of friends or even strangers, somehow really connects my mind to what I consider the essence of humanity. And one of my favorite places to enjoy fires besides my backyard is camping. And I remember a particular camping trip, was sitting with my family up at Plum Lake near Sainter, Wisconsin. And my dad, uh, who's at his best around a campfire, asked us to, to think about something. He asked us to think about what we were doing at this moment, right now, sitting by a campfire, talking to each other, enjoying the warmth, and then he asked us to think about how long humans have been doing this exact activity. And kind of we were realizing that we were really taking part in maybe the oldest and most widespread of all human traditions. And it really was at that moment that I just started to feel this deep, deep connection not only with people I didn't know, but people from tens of thousands of years ago. And, you know, it turns out when we look at fire, we are connecting with humanity from much earlier than that. Hundreds of thousands and, and 
perhaps millions of years ago, well before Homo sapiens were even a species. But for a moment, let's come back to the now and start with the first question. What is fire? What is this fleeting, dancing, and delicate form that you see in front of you uh, that's also powerful enough to destroy entire forests? That can be so essential to the human race that it has been part of every single human community around the world that for the last 100,000 years or more, whether it's isolated islands in the Pacific, alpine communities, uh, middle of the rainforests, so essential to humanity, yet it also causes more human deaths than any other force of nature. Uh, the simplest way to describe fire is that it's a chemical reaction where heat breaks down fuel into particles that recombine with oxygen in the air. So if, if you're cool with those 17 words as a definition for this magical quality of fire, then you're done and, and congratulations. But for everyone else, um, let's shed a little more light and heat on the subject. And since we're looking at a campfire, let's it's start a, with, yeah. I, I think a fire might be just a tad bit loud right now. I think we could take a log off. So I'm wondering if you could turn down the volume just a hair. How do I do that? Or if you just turn down, I think if you turn down your own volume, it might turn it down for us. Can you hear we still want to hear you, but the fire is just a tad bit loud. Does that help? I think so, maybe. Does that sound Wouldn't better? the volume be on your own computer? But then we would. We don't want to turn down your voice. Hmm. That's a good I wonder if you go to the if you go to the YouTube when you hover over the video, go to that yeah. volume bar and turn it down there. Yeah, hover the there thing. and then go down to the bottom left and, and then turn the volume down just a tad bit. Here? Yeah. Yeah. There's still a little bit. There you go. Thanks for taking off a log. Perfect. Does that help? <laughs> Yeah. Can you still hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, because if there's nothing about fires, you have to maintain it. You have to you have to love it. You can't just let it go or it'll do things like drown out your voice. <laughs> All right. Um so since we're 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 all looking at a now quieter campfire, let's let's start um with the process of burning wood. So there are a lot of things that burn and a lot of sources of fuel um, from wax in your candle to natural gas, um, but, but start with wood, start with the basics. So wood is primarily made of solid particles called cellulose. In fact, about half of wood is this solid cellulose. And that's the stuff that we turn into paper. And fun fact, it turns out that cellophane, the stuff we crafted with as kids, and I always thought was plastic, is in fact not plastic. It's regenerated paper. It's so not plastic that it's even biodegradable. But anyway, so so cellulose. Cellulose is the solid part of wood. Uh, and then when wood is heated, the cellulose begins to separate from the volatile gases, which are released as smoke. So on our last eco travel trip, um, and, and Marilyn, Ham Marilyn Hamilton was part of this team, we tried, it's about four of us, uh, we tried to make fire the old tried and true method of wood to wood friction with a bow. Uh, the four of us were working furiously, uh, also with my colleague Haley and um, Jim Holstein. And after what seemed like forever and some very sore muscles, we got smoke. The smoke that we got was the volatile gases being released from the cellulose. So if someone tells you that where there's smoke, there's fire, that's not always the case. Our ragtag team worked together to produce smoke, but we did not get fire. So. The gases are released from the solids 
and that's the smoke, then the solid matter turns into what we call char. Char is pretty much pure carbon. Charred wood, also sometimes known as charcoal, is essentially wood that has been separated from the smoke. It's wood that has been separated from the volatile gases, um, and it's wood that you can still burn, but almost all of the smoke has already been removed, which is why I, I never really understood charcoal. I kind of thought it was like burned wood, but if it were burned wood, it would be useless if, to, your, to your grill. It's wood you can still burn and convenient for whoever the grill master is. It's wood that has been removed of its smoke. So if you heat wood to a, without burning it to a high enough temperature, which is about 300 degrees, you release the smoke, but you keep the char. And charcoal is, as I said, essentially pure carbon. Um, and it's that pure carbon that allows you to take that charred wood or charcoal break it up into a powder, put it in a cloth bag, run water through it, and voila, you have yourself a charcoal filter uh, that filters out the impurities of water. So a good good survival tip if you need it. Um, the the charcoal will filter out things like, you know, impurities. Uh, we, we use charcoal filters in our faucets to get things like chlorine let out. Um, it can remove some of the critters like protozoa that we've learned can be pretty bad to ingest. Um, so again, this, this happens when you heat wood to about 300 degrees. So then that's not yet a fire. And I'm sad to say that our fire starting team never made it past the smoke stage to the ignition stage, despite our, our sweat, blood and tears. And, and Haley, if you're listening, I, I still apologize for all the abuse that your knuckles took. So I had to rely on other sources of information to get us from producing smoke. To producing fire. Um, 300 degrees wood produces smoke. At 500 degrees, the molecules in the wood, in the char, they themselves begin to break apart. And the, the carbon in cellulose, there's carbon that's, that's bound with hydrogen. And when you break up carbon and hydrogen atoms, they become extremely unstable. Remember, it took 500 degrees to get them to break out, break apart. And then they're super unstable and they are immediately looking to recombine with something. And the thing that both carbon and hydrogen are most attracted to is oxygen. Well, through a stroke of luck, it just so happens that there is oxygen in our atmosphere in the form of O2 or you know, two oxygen molecules. And the oxygen molecules, unlike the carbon, when it was in the char, the oxygen in the air has a relatively weak bond. So now you have this perfect storm of these radical free carbon and hydrogen atoms that were suddenly ripped apart and are really looking for something else to bond to. And then on the other hand, you have this atmospheric oxygen that, you know, they're just not really into their current partner. And so, boom, you have this recombination of molecules through a process called oxidation. Uh, that results in new molecules being formed, new, much more stable molecules of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and water. So a byproduct of wood burning fire is, one of them is water, which is released as steam. But then the most important byproduct for us is this, this recombination releases a whole lot of energy in two of our favorite forms. So first, it releases infrared energy, which produces the heat that causes us all to want to huddle around the fire in the first place. And then when the excited electrons return to their lower energy ring after the recombination, they also release photons through a process called incandescence or light through heat. So the same process that lights up the old incandescent bulbs, that's why they got so hot, it was producing light through heat. Um, and then our eyes see this whole process as this wonderful magical glow of fire. And if you take nothing else home today, just remember it is a proven scientific fact that everything looks better when cast in the glow of firelight. That's just an undeniable fact. So 
whether it's the person sitting across the fire from you, uh, whether it's your dog, whether it's the trees, the sand, the sky, everything. Uh, the glow of fire makes everything look cooler and more mysterious, as long as it's controlled. Uh, so the two most important by byproducts to humans of this oxidative recombination that we call fire are heat and light. When fires are hotter, because there's more oxygen uh, as fuel, the energy release shows up in different colors. So hotter fires burn blue and then eventually white, whereas the cooler parts of the fires are kind of the orange and then the yellow. And you can see that in campfires, you can see the different shades of orange and yellow. Uh, you can see that in candles, you can see that in Bunsen burners, uh, you can see that in jet engines that, that burn really blue. Um, and, and then the next step I think is probably the most important uh, that just makes everything so much more, I don't know, magical because if you think about it, you need heat to make fire, but a byproduct of fire is heat. So heat goes in and heat comes out, which then makes it this pretty much a self-perpetuating system as long as you have fuel in the form of wood in this case, and oxygen in the air. So it's once you get it started, it is a self-sustaining system for as long as the conditions are right. And that's why it's so important to us. Um, one of the reasons why it's so important to us. You only have to light a fire once under, under certain conditions. It's, and so it's why we can have an eternal flame. It's, it's, it's why we can light the Olympic torch in Athens and bring that fire to Tokyo. Um, it's why you only need one match to light as many candles as you want. Uh, now you're using the candle to light other candles. So that self-perpetuating system of fire is extremely important. Um, and we've, so we, we already kind of busted the myth that wherever there's smoke, there's fire. We know that's not true. And, and now I, I, I may get a little, I, I hope I don't anger some of you with this next one. Uh, this may come to a shock and I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, but uh, on May 9th, 1984, the venerable Bruce Springsteen, the boss, looked us all in the eyes and straight up lied to us. Um, and, and so again, I'm sorry to be the one to break the bad news, but Mr. Springsteen, we have just shown that one indeed can start a fire without a spark. As long as the fuel is heated to its unpiloted ignition temperature, which for wood is about 500 degrees Fahrenheit. If you can heat wood to 500 degrees, it will self-combust without a spark. Um, and besides, I think dancing in the light of the fire is slightly cooler than dancing in the dark. Zeke and Betsy, you might have to ask your parents about this reference. Also, quick side note, the other product of wood fires that I didn't mention yet is ash. Uh, the cellulose burns off, the volatile gases burn off, but the ash is basically the unburnable materials that are left behind. So if you do grill, and I don't know if you use charcoal briquettes or lump hardwood, um, but you'll notice that charcoal briquettes leave behind more ash because we add more unburn unburnable stuff to those little briquettes, um, things like binding agents, and they don't burn as clean. Whereas lump char charcoal burns much more cleaner, and you, you'll probably notice that it also leaves behind less ash because it's just wood. Um, okay, but back to sparks. So you don't need a spark to start a fire. And if you think about it, like what do you do when a fire is dying and there's no visible flame? Uh, you don't have to go get a new match to get the flame back. You just you get down and, and you blow on the embers a little bit or, or you fan the flames a little bit. Um, and that fire was just, it had, re it had gone below the temperature needed for the flame. Uh, it was just lacking a bit of oxygen. So the fire needs to breathe. It needs that oxygen for that recombination process. And that's also why it's easy to smother a fire. So when you're blowing, you're adding more oxygen fuel, which increases the temperature. So it gets back above that combustion point. And um, another way to think about it is, is we've all seen images of wildfires that are started by lightning and in my mind, I always thought, well, lightning is the spark, but lightning is not a spark. Lightning is this 
electrostatic discharge that, like fire, releases energy in the form of heat and light for lightning, actually extreme heat in the case of lightning. But unlike fire, lightning does not involve this oxidation process. A, a spark is, is essentially fire through oxidation at a really small scale. Uh, so a small number of molecules burn kind of fast and furious. Um, and really a spark is just kind of a mini fire. But just because it's a mini fire doesn't mean it's not extremely important to our story. In fact, a spark is what allowed humanity to become the only animals in the history of the world to be able to create fire. And one can only gaze at a fire like this one and wonder about these earliest relationships between humans and fire like we did at Plum Lake. And when I say humans, I'm really opening my umbrella wide. So any species with the genus Homo is considered humans. Uh, and if you're looking for a good read on this topic, I think it was Robin that recommended a book called uh, Sapiens, uh, A Brief History of Humankind. And, um, but the earliest evidence of our ancestors modifying stones for tools actually predates even this genus Homo. So that was before human, the species Homo sapiens and the genus Homo, what we consider human. So before humans, our human ancestors um, started to modify stones uh, about three million years ago. And, and it, it is believed that uh, a piece of stone was flaked off another stone, either on purpose or on accident and that was likely used to start cutting things like meat off of bones. Again, there's, there's a lot of speculation and imagination involved. Um, but using stones as tools continued, the knowledge spread, uh, and we got slightly better at using these tools over the next uh, two million plus years. The first evidence that humans, and, and this would be Homo erectus, the first evidence that humans were controlling fire dates back to about one million years ago, and this is primarily from um, the Wunderwerk cave in South Africa. We can only speculate as to how they were using fire, but there's evidence in this cave that fire was either created there or brought to that spot in the cave over and over again to the same spot, kind of like the first fire pit. Um, it's possible by this time we were using the fire cook, then fire to cook. Um, they're not sure about that, but either way, it's likely that they were eating around that fire uh, because of the bone fragments and ash that they found at the site. But regardless, that next big leap for humanity is to go from capturing fire that's naturally occurs um, to actually creating fire. And like a lot of things in humanity, we don't know if this knowledge started at one location at one time, or if it started independently throughout history at different places in the world. Um, they're both equally likely. But we do know that by the Bronze Age, fire starting was widespread uh, because of one of the earliest murder mysteries in our time, and we call him Utsi, or the Iceman who was walking in the Alps at the current day border between Austria and Italy. And unfortunately, Utsi met an untimely death. It's possible that he just fell into a glacial crevasse, which mummified his body and, until modern humans found him extremely well preserved in 1991. But Utsi had multiple wounds, uh, including an arrowhead embedded in his left shoulder. So, it's more likely that he was killed by a fellow human. Why is this important to our story today? Utsi was carrying the first documented fire starting kit. So in his pouch, he had a piece of pyrite or iron sulfide, and he had stone tools, and he had some light, fluffy fungal material that was likely used as tinder. And, and these are the materials needed to start fire. And by extension, this is how you can look into starting a fire the next time you're camping. So obviously, the, one of the most important things you need is tinder. So you need light, fluffy, thin material 
or an accelerant that has an extremely low ignition temperature. Um, earlier humanity likely used things like this light fluffy mushrooms uh, or the shredded inner bark of trees. So if it's made out of cellulose, you need something that's, that has a very high surface area to volume ratio. So very, very thin with lots of air spaces in the middle. Um, modern day humans have the advantage of using things like dryer lint or cloths coated in wax. Uh, apparently Ali Ward says the Doritos are wonderful fire starters, which I have yet to try. Um, but you need something that catches fire quickly. And then to restore some credit to Bruce Springsteen, starting a campfire usually does require a spark. We don't have things that can just, like lightning, uh, produce, you know, really, really, really high temperatures. So the, the two materials that have been tried and tested for a long time by humans is flint against steel. So when flint and steel collide, they produce a, a few loose airborne iron atoms that are super unstable. And, and like the carbon and hydrogen in the wood, those really unstable iron atoms immediately oxidize with the oxygen and produce just enough heat to, to light whatever tinder you have at the ready. Um, it's also enough to light the explosive material we know of as gunpowder. So if you've heard of a flint lock gun, when you produce the trigger, you're smashing flint against steel to produce a spark through oxidation that lights gunpowder. And if we go back to our poor friend Utsi, he was carrying all of the necessary fire starting materials. He didn't have steel, but he did have pyrite, which is uh, rich in iron sulfide for the sparks. And then again, the mushrooms as tinder. Uh, and there's really strong evidence that Neanderthals were creating fire well over 50,000 years ago. Um, and that their ancestors were already starting fires, not just capturing, but probably starting fires over 200,000 years ago. Eventually, one of the most important tools for any human to carry around were these uh, Acheulean hand axes, which had hard, sharp edges for cutting. And then the middle part was used for starting fires. It's like the first multi-tool. Um, and then these eventually became status symbols that were decorated and um, it's thought that these were used in early courtship and humans. So much like a peacock will display their tail feathers, um, a human would carry around a very elaborate cutting and fire starting ax. And sometimes the axes were so elaborate or so heavy that they probably weren't even functional at that point, but, but likely a status symbol used for mate choice. So I love how Allie Ward says that today's kids use ax body spray to attract mates, but the kids of the past used just axes to attract mates. Once humans were able to create and manage the fires, it paved the way for just about every technological advance, kind of snowballed, uh, snow puts out fires, but it, it, it allowed humans to go to places that were inhospitable. It paved the way for ceramics, and farming and metalworks and glassworks and building and uh, so many of these advances that mostly mostly occurred over the last 10,000 years required fire and uh, there are some who also argue that cooking food led to bigger brains and um, also pushed hum fire also may have pushed humanity from being mostly nocturnal most mammals are nocturnal humans are one of the, the rare ones um, that fire could have been a push in us becoming the diurnal mammals that we are today, um, you know, college students notwithstanding, because as we adapted to the daylight fires, or as we adapted to daylight, um, the fires allowed us to extend that day into the night, and it also allowed us to see in places we couldn't see for hidden dangers and other things. So. Um, another really important advance was to figure out how to travel with fire. But making fires is, is a little bit of a, you know, a thing. It, it, it takes some work. Uh, it's not always super reliable. It could be raining. And um, it's, it's much easier to create fire from an ember. And many groups of humans learned how to bring fire with them 
through the through by using an ember to carry fire. So for some, it was finding just the right fungus. Uh, there's some some of those table fungi you find on trees. If you break them apart and you put a, an ember in the middle of the soft spongy start and close it up, the conditions are just right to keep the fire going without you know without the big combustion to keep that heat that process uh, going in a controlled way. So then you take the ember that's wrapped in a big mushroom and you wrap that in cloth and essentially put it in your pocket. Um, then let's say you do this in the morning, you get all your stuff together, you, you travel to your next de destination. And then by the time you're ready to start a fire at the new place, you still have that already lit ember, which really, really helps speed things along. The Kikani Blackfoot Confederacy of South Dakota fashioned this beautiful system of, of stuffing a buffalo horn with just the right combination of moss and hardwood and softwood and rawhide uh, to steward an ember for a long journey. Um, and this, this ember burning process can also be a cautionary tale because sometimes underneath a fire, particularly if you're building a fire in a new place, uh, there are often roots underneath the fire and the root can sometimes act as a slow burning ember ember and there are several stories of campfires that start wildfires in totally different locations uh, the people that built the fire and put it out thought everything was out but underneath you had these burning embers they travel and they can even travel underwater um, and and then they can start a fire. I mean, it's rare, but it has happened. They can start a fire at a different place. So embers can be really important, but they can also be dangerous. Um, so here we are today, enjoying this virtual fire together. Fires remain an extremely important part of humanity from the practical to the cultural. It's used in celebrations and ceremonies. The San people in the Kalahari use fire for business by day and for social interactions by night. Before modern technology, smoke signals were a very common way across cultures to communicate over long distances. And to get a puff of smoke, you just threw green wood on the hot fire, which produced a white puff that could be seen for miles. And if there's too much smoke in your fire and the wind's blowing it into your face, because unlike Springsteen, the platters were not lying when they said smoke gets in your eyes. All you have to do is to, to get the smoke to clear out of your face uh, and to go somewhere else. And this is, this is one of the most important things I taught my kids right away, is you just repeat the words, white rabbit, white rabbit, white rabbit. Eventually that smoke leaves and goes somewhere else. So um, you can also thank fire for the Maillard reaction, which produces the best tasting foods in the world. The creation of fire is an absolutely human trait. No other species has learned to create it, although this is super cool. There is a hawk in Australia that has learned to spread fires with branches and then they start fires over other places and then they hunt on the things that are scattering from the fire. So there is one other species that that manages fire, but we are the only species uh, or group of species, the humans, that have learned to create it. Um, King Louis knew that and, and that's why he went through such great lengths to learn how to start, start fires from Mowgli. Um, it's also why a recent study showed that Gazing at fires has many restorative, physical, and emotional health benefits. People who gazed at videos of fires, and most importantly, videos with the sound on so they could hear that crackling, just like you're doing, experience lower blood pressure and signs of relaxation. Um, so hopefully we all are getting a little bit healthier just by participating uh, in this program. And um, 
I'll end today's session with another somewhat personal story. I've had the uh, absolute amazing fortune and good luck to have done a little traveling in my life. And I was on a field course near the, the Daintree Rainforest in Queensland, Australia. And our group leaders were, were members of, of an Aboriginal community. They started a fire on the beach at the end of the day and they told stories of the dream time that have been passed through thousands and thousands of generations. This may have been the moment in my life where I felt most connected to humanity over space and time. I was lying down, staring into this beautiful crackling fire, thinking about what my dad had said 15 years earlier at Plum Lake. Um, I was listening to stories that had been told for tens of thousands of years and, and as I began to fall asleep, I, I just felt myself dri drift in and out of this dreaming space and um, maybe one of the most magical and surreal moments of my entire life. So this is the story of the two sisters from Patty Rowe, who's an Aboriginal elder of the Gula Rabulu of the Nakina community in Australia. Two sisters, Naji people, spirit beings, regularly come out of the ocean on the beach, what is today Reddle Beach in Broome. They come from the reef and dry up on the beach. Then they look around. One day they are back on the beach and look for Njari Jari, small bulbs in the sand to eat. While they are busy digging, a bushman, one man living alone in the bush, no other person, only him, he sees the sisters. Well, he never seen anybody else and never woman, so he is curious. But at the same time, he knows that they are not from this world. They are still spirit beings who can go and out. Being human and curious, he goes towards them. The sisters never seen another person either and freeze until he touches them, and at that moment they cannot go back to their world. He gives them smell. The sisters turn themselves into rocks, and their spirits fly away in form of birds, white cockatoos, which fly away east, inland, until they see a big open field where they land. As soon as they touch the ground, they turn into women, a younger woman and an older sister. They feel hungry and look for Jari Jari, as it is their last memory. The sisters split up. One goes one way and the other the other way. The older sister finds a large field of Jari Jari. Being greedy, she thinks how to keep them all to herself. So she tells her sister to make a fire because you can eat them raw or cook them. The younger sister does not know how to make fire. So she tries everything, hits rocks together, tries different wood until she finds one tree, Mechanine. From this tree in a sawing motion, she makes fire first time. She's very happy. But while she was trying to make fire, her sister was thinking how to keep and eat all the onions herself. So she looked around until she found a tree, Lyrigan. From this tree, she pulled the bark and made the shape of a snake, a big, long one. Where the mouth was, she put four sticks upright for the teeth. When the younger sister came happily running towards her sister, she saw the big snake form on the ground. She tried to jump over it, but no luck. And she tried to go under it, but no good. So she sang out, Sister, big snake, cannot come to you. At that moment, the two sisters and the snake went up into the sky. So today we can see them. At a time when you can find the Jari Jari, the sisters are each a star on either side of the Milky Way. The Bushman, who had broken his own law by touching the two sisters, tried to run away, but could not. He became very heavy. So he shed his heaviness into a rock formation then being much lighter, he tried to go further. However, he realized he had to punish himself, so he sat down in meditation posture. As such, he changed himself into a rock wallaby, so he could have life, but had to be always worried to become food for animals and people.
while the fire is still going, does anybody have anything they want to say? 